Welcome. As you work to implement the infinite banking concept in your life, you want to make sure, number one, that you have the personal discipline to build wealth. That's very important. All right. And number two, of course, you want to make sure you get an understanding of what's going on so you know what to do. And this is where a coach can help you. So make sure that you have a good coach that understands the process of building wealth with the infinite banking concept. Finally, number three, make sure you have the right kind of life insurance with a mutual company and that the policy is properly designed to help you build wealth in an efficient manner. And a good coach can help you here as well, but you should have a basic understanding of the types of life insurance yourself so that you understand what's going on. Well, let's look at the different kinds of life insurance together. Basically, there's two types of insurance, uh, term and single premium. And you see these represented on the different sides of the scale here. Term insurance on the right-hand side and single premium insurance on the left. Term insurance is essentially renting life insurance coverage. Based on the mortality tables and the calculations made by the actuaries at the life insurance company, they know how much they need to charge you in order to provide a death benefit to your heirs in the event that you die within a specified time frame. Well, generally speaking, each year you live, you're more likely to die. So what happens every year to the premium on a one-year term policy? That's right, it increases every year. You can see that by the red stair steps here. Now, paying the yearly increasing premium isn't real fun. So insurance companies usually offer level term policies, which are just that, level premium payments that are guaranteed not to rise during a specified period of time, usually 10 to 30 years. So right here you see a representation of that here in the orange. Essentially, the insurance company is saying, instead of facing these ever-increasing premiums, you can pay a little bit more than you would have to pay for one-year coverage right now. You can see that by the orange area, it's higher than what the red would be to start out with. And we'll use this extra to offset the higher premiums that would be due as you get older. So you can see that the orange then can dip below the red as you get older and just keep you with a level premium for those years. Problem comes when uh, the orange line ends. Now your premium jumps back up to the red. So that's what term insurance is all about. Now, before we cover single premium insurance, that uh, single premium is over here on the left, let's take a look at some types of insurance that are based on term insurance. Uh, first of all, there's universal life insurance. And universal life insurance is essentially one-year term insurance over here on the left and a cash fund. All right, this means that you pay premiums for your term insurance plus whatever more you want to pay in a premium in a given year goes to your cash fund, which earns a rate of interest. And this rate fluctuates, but sometimes the insurance company will provide a minimum guaranteed interest rate. You know, many insurance agents will tell you that a benefit of universal life insurance is that when you die, your heirs will get both the cash value and the death benefit. This is because universal life cash values are completely different than cash values in a traditional whole life insurance policy. We'll discuss this a little bit more later, but in my opinion, they should come up with a different term for universal life cash values. Universal life insurance was put together in the 1980s when interest rates were high, and so it looked good because you could earn high rates of interest on this cash fund, and the growth of the cash fund then was designed to offset the ever-increasing cost of the term insurance as you got older. But even so, you know, interest rates are a lot lower than they were in the 80s, but even with them being high back then, R. Nelson Nash says when he first saw the universal life policy, he ran some illustrations. And they kept falling apart when the insured attained age 65 to 70. He says the cost of the one-year term became prohibitive at the advanced ages and ate up the cash fund from that point forward. So when these people got older, their cash funds started going down. Not something you really want at that age. Now there's some variations of universal life, uh, notably variable universal life and equity index universal life. With variable universal life, you still have the one-year term insurance here and the cash fund over here, but the policy owner can choose between some options provided by the insurance company as to where the monies in the cash fund are invested. And these choices usually include stocks, mutual funds, which are assumed to offer a higher potential for return, but they also offer a higher potential for loss. So uh, when 2008 came along, we saw many people that lost a huge chunk of their universal life cash values overnight. Some had to pay extra premiums to keep their death benefit on the term insurance from dropping. Not very fun. Now, equity index universal life insurance, another kind of universal life insurance, is actually pretty close to variable universal life insurance, but instead of investing the cash fund directly in stocks and mutual funds, they invest it in the index of those stocks. So there's not a huge difference there. Well, the insurance company will sometimes offer guarantees such as a minimum interest rate 
with this type of a policy, but they also cap the profits you can earn. And there are several strict conditions, such as if a premium payment's late, then you can lose the minimum guaranteed interest rate, et cetera. So basically, universal life insurance is an all-in-one, buy term and invest the difference vehicle. And for more information on this, you can watch the videos regarding buy term and invest the difference on our website. But is universal life insurance a vehicle you really want to depend on as you build wealth? And based on what we just covered, the answer is no. Now let's go back to our first diagram. We have single premium insurance on the left here, term insurance on the right. Single premium insurance, stuff over here on the left, is where you have a lump sum. You want to make a single payment to purchase life insurance that will pay a death benefit to your heirs regardless of when you die. Okay, that will cover you, in other words, for your whole life. Okay? Now, based again on the calculations of the actuaries at the life insurance company, the company knows how much premium you need to collect today in order to pay a death benefit regardless of when you die. And of course, the premium is going to be much higher, but a large percentage of the premium amount will appear as cash values right away. We'll see that here on the screen. The red bar over here on the left represents that one-time payment for the single premium life insurance. And the dark blue then represents the cash values. So they, you can see the cash values start out at a relatively high percentage of that premium payment, and they go on up from there. Now this cash value is completely different from the cash value of universal life insurance. It still represents the surrender value of the policy if you decide to cancel it, but the cash value of single premium insurance more directly represents the portion of risk that you no longer pose to the insurance company. So let's see how this works here. Remember that the single premium insurance pays a death benefit whenever you die. The insurance company wants to make sure their risk is minimized when you're most likely to die. Well, you're going to die someday, so at some point in the future, the insurance company needs to completely cover their risk. Sometimes age 100 is used, sometimes age 121 is this target age. Okay, but looking at our uh, picture here, the light blue represents the risk the insurance company is taking by insuring you. Over time, that risk is, goes to zero as the dark blue cash values rise to meet it, and they meet up there in the right-hand corner of this graph. Now, at this point, the policy is said to have matured, and the death benefit and the cash value will be equal. They can both come together at that point, and if you're still living, you'll get a check for the death benefit minus any outstanding loan. The main point here is that with single premium life insurance, the cash values are part of the death benefit. They're all kind of tied together here. Whereas with universal life insurance, the cash value is separate from the death benefit. It's over there in that cash fund, and it tends to decrease as the cost of the term insurance part of the policy rises. So back to our main diagram here, notice that uh, we have the two extremes here. Term insurance, where you're essentially renting life insurance coverage, is over here on the right, and single premium insurance, where you're buying life insurance coverage with a lump sum, that's much more expensive. Now, life insurance coverage, uh, life insurance companies started blending these two products together and came up with a policy that you could pay a yearly premium that's higher than term insurance, but would be less than the premium for single all that upfront premium for single premium insurance. And they called this insurance ordinary life. Pretty close to term insurance right down there. It's a type of whole life insurance since it covers you for your whole life. An ordinary life insurance combines a lot of term insurance with a little bit of single premium insurance. And as you get older, the policy's getting older as well, the single premium insurance starts taking over and canceling out the would-be ever-increasing cost of the term insurance. And by the target age, the cash value and the death benefit are equal, just as with single premium insurance. But many people don't want to pay these premiums as long as they live. Let's go ahead and take a look at this graph, how this ordinary life insurance looks. The premiums are represented in red all along here, at the bottom. The light blue, of course, is the risk that you pose to the insurance company, and the dark blue represents the cash values. These premiums down here in red go for your whole life, so many people don't want to pay these as long as they live. So the life insurance companies add a little more single premium over on the left there and subtract a little bit more term insurance and made life paid up at age 65, life paid up at 20, and so on. Now as we get closer to the single premium side of the scale here, our diagram, um, the cash values in the early years tend to go up and the initial insurance amount goes down. But on a side path here, it's interesting to note that the, when you start out closer to the single premium side, with more single premium and less term insurance, even though your initial death benefit's lower, it's often higher by the time you're most likely to die. Now, there were a couple of U.S. laws that were passed, and many people saw the value, the qualities of the single premium life insurance over here on the left, 
and they realized the security of the insurance companies versus the security of the banks. They were purchasing large amounts of single premium and life insurance with money they were pulling out from the banks. So the bankers lobbied the government and the government came in and set a line called the Modified Endowment Contract, which you see right here in this red box right here. Basically, this definition says that if you add enough single premium and subtract enough term insurance in order to place a policy to the left of this red line right here, then they're going to treat it as a qualified plan for tax purposes rather than life insurance. This means a 10% penalty on any loans withdrawals before age 59 and a half. Income taxes due on anything you loan withdraw out from the policy on a last in first out basis. So why bother getting on the wrong side of this line? Since you're trying to build wealth, you just want to stay on the right hand side of that line as close as possible. And this is where a good coach will be able to help you. So how can whole life insurance cash value benefit you as you build wealth? Well, when you have cash values, like we've just been talking about, you can take a loan from the insurance company using the policy as collateral. Well, so what? You can take a loan from the cash values of universal life insurance also. You see that on the right hand side of the screen. That's true. But note that with a loan from a whole life insurance policy, the left hand side here, you're using your policy as collateral. And thus, the loan does not affect the growth of your policy as long as the interest is paid. With Universal Life, on the other hand, when you take a loan, the money comes directly from your cash fund. You can see that right there. And you stop earning interest in your cash fund on the amount of that loan that you take. And that's why you want whole life insurance rather than universal life insurance when you're wanting to build wealth. Now, just to clarify, there are some instances where a loan on a whole life insurance policy can affect your dividend rate. This is called direct versus non-direct recognition. But we're not going to dive into that definition here. It doesn't make a huge difference and if you want to know, your coach can help you understand. So in the first part of this video, I mentioned that the policy should be with a mutual insurance company. Why? Because with a stock held insurance company over here on the right, the profits of the insurance company go to stockholders. Whereas with the mutual insurance company, the profits over here on the left go to the participating policyholders. Now, some stock held insurance companies do have participating policies that may fit your needs for building wealth, but most of the time you'll find participating whole life insurance policies are offered by mutual life insurance companies. And to fully understand what's going on here, we need to take a step back and look at the big picture. When the actuaries and rate makers at a mutual insurance company make their calculations, they remember that they don't have any stockholders to take up the slack in, in case they have a bad year. Maybe they don't do as well as they're projecting. Maybe the investment went bad or more people died that year than projected. And to cover for this margin of possible error, a mutual insurance company collects more money from the policyholders to cover just in case they have a bad year. So in this example, we have the policyholders over here. The insurance company here is saying, well, we need $10, but we'll collect 11 to be on the safe side just in case we have this bad year. And over time, the projections of the actuaries come very close to the actual results. And then the directors that run the company have some extra money on hand at the end of the year. So down here you see, end of the year, we have $120, but only needed $115. So they'll usually put part of this extra into a contingency fund in case next year isn't so good. And the rest of this profit then is distributed to the participating policyholders. In this example, they take $1 and put it into the contingency fund and they distribute the other $4 to the policyholders and they call this a dividend. But it's really a return of premium that was already paid. And so it's not taxable to the policyholder unless the policyholder withdraws an amount over and above the premiums that have been paid. Now these dividends are not guaranteed because of course the company isn't guaranteed to make a profit. The companies that we represent here at Life Benefits have given dividends back to their policyholders for over 100 years, which is a very stable track record that goes back through many recessions and back through the Great Depression, but of course we don't know the future. The nice thing is, however, once the dividends distributed, it can never be taken away again. So this $4 that you see going from the insurance company to the policyholders, the insurance company can never take that back again. Okay, these dividends can help you in the process of building wealth if you, when you have them purchase paid up additional insurance. So hopefully you now have a better understanding of the different kinds of life insurance and in particular the different combinations of whole life insurance and what combinations can best help you in the process of building wealth with the infinite banking concept. Nice thing is that you don't have to worry about understanding all the details of life insurance unless you really want to because when you have a good wealth coach they can help you with these things.
Not life benefits, we specialize in coaching people as they build wealth. So you need a coach? Give us a call. We'd love to be part of your wealth team.